Well, good afternoon, everybody. I can't tell you quite how delighted I am to be here um, at an international congress on clinical engineering and to be given an opportunity to talk about HGA, Health Technology Assessment, because um, throughout my uh, long career in clinical engineering, and don't let this boyish good looks fool you, I have had a long career in clinical engineering, now spreading into its fourth decade, and throughout all of that time, until relatively recently at least, health technology assessment has not had a great deal to do with clinical engineering, and clinical engineering has not had a great deal to do with health technology assessment. But now we're very much on the map, and I personally am a real convert and champion for HTA. And indeed, I think HTA is a discipline that we clinical engineers really must adopt and become very central to everything that we do. I want to take you back, because I say clinical engineering and HTA haven't had much to do with each other for a long time, but I want to take you back to the beginning of my career um, and say how HDA had a major impact on me then, um, even though at the time I didn't know it. If I take you right back to the mid-1980s, and back then I was a clinical engineer and I was doing a lot of work on optical techniques in medicine, um, and I came up with this technique uh, that I'm showing you a picture of now. Now, I know compared to the high-quality medical images that we're used to seeing today, and there's lots of them out in the foyer at the moment, these are not the greatest images you will ever see, but bear with me, look at the data on the slide. This was back in the mid-1980s. And what you're looking at here is something that I thought at the time was absolutely fantastic. This is actually a picture of my hand um, over a sequence of a several minutes. Um, and the top picture that you're looking at there, the top row of images, um, is telling you the total amount of blood, the total hemoglobin in my hand, and the bottom set of images is showing the total amount of oxygenated hemoglobin, so the oxygen in the skin of my hand. And like I say, I thought this was absolutely brilliant. I was wearing a tourniquet at the time and exercising my hand throughout the 10-minute period, and with the eye of faith, go, go, go with the flow, boys and girls, with the eye of faith, that top row of images, the total amount of blood, all look pretty much the same, as they should, because there's no blood going in and there's no blood coming out because of the tourniquet. That second row, um, again, go with the flow, that second uh, row of images is changing. It's getting a darker blue, uh, indicating that we are losing oxygen, I am losing oxygen in my hand. Back in the 1980s, I thought this was brilliant. I thought this new technique was going to make me famous, going to make me rich, going to enable me to retire early. But there was, I have to tell you, just one or two tiny weeny technical problems uh, with this technology. The first of which is, in order to generate those images, I had to do an awful lot of what I thought were very clever sums, clever algorithms in the background. And we didn't have the computing power that we have today. Um, and back then, this took a long time. In fact, it took so long, I used to have to set this program running overnight and come back in the morning to see whether it had worked, keeping my fingers crossed that the cleaner hadn't unplugged the computer at some point throughout the night. Something of a disadvantage, <clears throat> but not too bad when you're a research scientist looking at your own hands, not desperately clever if you're trying to run a busy hospital clinic. So that was one technical problem uh, with, this, with, this, with this technology. But that wasn't the worst thing. No, no, no. In order to capture these images, it took about a minute and a half to capture each one of these images. Now, a minute and a half isn't very long when you're taking a picture of your own hand in a research laboratory. A minute and a half is a very long time if you're asking your patient to sit still. It's an even longer length of time if you're asking your patient to hold their breath. I don't know if you've ever tried doing that for a minute and a half, but it was very difficult. So that was quite a big technical problem when they're trying to use this in a busy clinical department. But that wasn't the worst part of this technology. In order to get these images, I needed a huge amount of white light because I was shining white light on my patients, on my image, and looking at the reflected light coming back and passing it through a very narrow wavelength filter. So I was only getting a tiny bit of light back. So I needed a huge amount of light to start with. That wasn't in itself a big problem. I had some massive uh, halogen, quartz halogen uh, 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 floodlights, the sorts of things that you would light up football pitches or, ter uh, or, or ferry f uh, terminals. So I got bags of light in. The trouble with bags of light back in those days was you also got bags of heat. So I was inducing first and on one or two occasions second degree burns on my patients, which again wasn't really the, uh, the desired effect I was after. So that was quite a big problem, but that wasn't the worst thing about this technology. The worst thing about this technology was that nobody wanted it. 
I thought it was wonderful. I'd spent a lot of time designing it, putting it together, coming to this point. I thought it was the best thing ever. Nobody else wanted it. I hadn't considered which patients were going to benefit on this, which patient conditions I could use this on, where in the patient pathway this technology might be used. It was clearly going to be an expensive technology even then. Hadn't any idea who was going to be willing to pay for it in order to get it into routine clinical application. In short, I hadn't given any thought at all to, health, uh, to HTA, to health technology assessment of this. A rookie mistake, I hear you say, but don't be too hard on me. Because back in the 1980s, nobody was thinking about HTA in medtech. In fact, nobody really was thinking about HTA. We knew in healthcare in general that there was a problem. Even back in the 1980s, we knew there was a problem. We knew that healthcare was expensive. And almost every health system, wherever you were in the world, almost every health system didn't have enough money. So there were some big questions that needed to be asked. We haven't got enough money and demand was rising. And we knew why demand was rising and the answer is the same today. As a population, we were getting bigger, we were getting fatter, we were getting older, we were getting more prone to long-term conditions, COPD, dementia, cardiac conditions. Our, expect our life expectancy was increasing rapidly and the demands that we were placing on the health service and the amount what we expected out of health services was inc increasing even more rapidly. And I say that almost like it's a bad thing. Um, of course, it's not. It's a really good thing. As an industry, healthcare has been fantastically successful. But we were then, and we are now, um, in danger of becoming victims of our own success. What the challenge that healthcare services face now, as in the 80s, is how do we provide more and more, better and better healthcare for an expanding population? So the discipline of HTA, Health Technology Assessment, was born. Governments, health providers, policy makers had some big questions to ask. They wanted to know with their finite financial resources, where should they place those? Where should they put the effort in healthcare? Should we put the effort into healthcare, um, into chronic conditions, into, into dementia, in, into diabetes, into COPD? Or should we put the effort into more acute things, cancer treatments, trauma, surgery? Should we focus our efforts on the very young, newborns, neonates, children, who after all, have their whole lives ahead of them, or should we be developing technologies, developing healthcare services for the growing older population? So there were some big questions and very difficult questions to answer, and the field, the discipline um, of HGA started to try and address these questions. But of course, lowly clinical engineers like us were not involved in that sort of discussion, were not involved in designing healthcare technology assessment tools back then. So HDA developed initially to answer some of these really big strategic questions. But it wasn't long before HDA started to find another discipline, another area to work, and that area was pharma, was big pharma. Big pharma companies back then, and as we know still now, spend millions, billions, perhaps trillions on, 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 on new medical, uh, uh, new drugs, on new pharmacological products. And having invested that amount of money in developing those drugs, they want to sell them to us. They want to sell them to health organizations, to doctors, to nurses, and indeed to the general public. So they started flooding the market with publicity, with adverts for their products. My drug is better than the drug you're currently using. Yes, my drug might be more expensive than the one you're currently using, but it's much better. And governments, healthcare providers, had to start answering questions like, well, is it better? And how much better? And how do I measure that betterness? And if it's more expensive, how much more expensive? And does it save me any money downstream? So a lot of new HGA tools were developed in response to the development of pharma, uh, big pharma uh, presenting us with that challenge. And again, clinical engineers didn't get involved in those discussions, didn't get involved in developing tools for HGA. And it's only relatively latterly in the last maybe 10 years or so that people have seriously started asking questions about HTA and medtech. Um, but the tools have already been designed by the preceding years. So why have people not put the effort into designing HTA tools for, for MedTech? Well, there are lots of reasons, and I could spend hours talking about it, but the real key reason that there are less, has been less effort put into uh, MedTech HTA is because MedTech HTA is hard. It's difficult to do MedTech HTA, and it's difficult to do MedTech HTA for lots of reasons, and primarily those reasons are all stem from the fact that medical device technology is different 
the way we use it, the way we design it, uh, from the way that we use and, 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 and use drugs. And there are four key differences between medtech and drugs and pharma. The first of those is around the technical aspects of medtech. So, and, and that itself can be split up into various things. The, 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 one of the key ones there is the, the length of the life cycle for the product. We still use today drugs which were manufactured and designed 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and I should confess at the moment, I'm on a drug that was designed 40 years ago, got terrible backache, was diagnosed with a acute problem last week, and I'm on a heady cocktail of painkillers and diazepam. So if I'm talking complete rubbish, please forgive me for that, but it feels great being up here today. But the life cycle of med tech is very, very much shorter than that. How many of us have a mobile phone that is 10, 20, 30 years old or a laptop? And the same, of course, is true for med tech. So if you're doing HTA for med tech, you've got to do it quickly. If you take too long over evaluating new med tech, by the time you've got your HTA answer, someone's come along with a new version of that product or a new product altogether. And then another difference in terms of the technical aspects of med tech is the maintenance that you need. By and large, if you buy a drug today and use it today, um, you can use it today, you can use it next week, you can use it next month or in six months' time, and the drug will, be the, will have the same impact, by and large. But with a device, you've got to maintain it, you've got to look after it. Sometimes that's relatively simple, just cleaning it, changing the battery or probe covers. Sometimes that involves quite sophisticated workshop uh, facilities and technologists to do that. And that difference has to be factored in when you're doing HTA. And then there's all the intercomponent dependability of, of medtech. Now, drugs have interdependability as well, of course. Some drugs won't work unless you've got another drug there. Some drugs are confused if you give people two or three or four drugs. And that needs to be factored into drug uh, HTA. But it's a much more complicated picture when you start looking at device technology. You might come up with a new endoscopic tool, for example. But you can only test whether that endoscopic tool works well and do HDA on it if you've got an endoscope, if you've got an insulator, if you've got monitoring and a camera stack and all the other things that you need in order to use uh, endoscopy procedures. So it's very much more complicated how we engage with other devices when we're trying to do HDA on our new device. And then there's a the whole business of clinical evaluation. It's relatively easy to do clinical evaluation on drugs. It's quite difficult sometimes to do it um, in real-world situations on device technology. <clears throat> to start with, most people know how to give a drug. If you give a new drug to a doctor or a nurse, generally speaking, they know how to give it to the patient. You give them a new piece of technology, and first of all, you've got to train them in how to use it. And depending on the sophistication of that technology, it might take a week, it might take a month, it might take six months before the clinician is proficient in using it. So don't try and evaluate the technology during that period or you'll get unreliable results. And then we have the whole business about doing RCTs. RCTs with drugs, relatively straightforward. You have a control group, you give a placebo. You have an intervention group, you give them the real drug. Doing RCTs with medical device technology is always difficult, sometimes impossible, and very often unethical. So it's a challenge to get good quality data when we're doing evaluations, clinical evaluations of new technology. And then there's another whole pile of issues of differences between drugs and med tech, which we could refer to as in-use or in-service issues. Again, it's about dependency on who's using it. By and large, if you give a patient a drug in a hospital, it'll work in the same way as if you give it to them in a GP surgery, if you give it to them in a home base, if you give them in a care home, the drug will by and large work in the same way. You've got a device, it's very different who uses it, where they use it, and how they use it. And then there's the compliance of the patient or the user or the uh, clinician using that technology. Again, compliance is a difficulty with some drugs, particularly with our older patients and our cognitively impaired patients, and that needs to be factored into drug HTA, but devices are even more difficult. Some users use them well, some users forget to use them. Even professional clinical users get tired and forget how to use the device properly. So in-use issues are very difficult to do HTA on. And then there's the financial aspects. By and large, again, drugs are fairly easy to work out the financial aspects. The cost of a drug is the cost of a drug. The more you buy, the more expensive it is. Sometimes you get volume discounts. But by and large, it's a relatively simple thing. But with uh, devices, it can be very different indeed. 
Sometimes you just buy the device and that's the cost, but sometimes you use a device on one patient, on two patients, on a thousand patients. Sometimes you don't buy the device, you rent it or hire it. Sometimes the manufacturer gives you the device for free so long as you buy their consumables. So the financial models at which we use on our medical devices are very much more complicated than those for drugs. Plus you've got to factor in a load of other stuff too. All that maintenance, all that installation costs, all those other devices that you might need to use it and infrastructure you might need to use it all have to be factored in. So there's all these different problems that you have when you're trying to do medtech HTA that just don't exist with drugs. So it's difficult. Dana, you have five minutes. Thank you. So if it's so difficult, what's the answer? What can we do about it? Well, you'll be surprised to hear me standing at a clinical engineering congress um, that the answer is clinical engineers. Look back at those differences between drugs and med tech. The life cycle problems. Um, who knows more about the life cycle problems of a new device uh, than clinical engineers who are forever bringing devices in, maintaining them, looking after them. In terms of evaluating device technology, um, HGA experts, wonderful as they are, generally haven't been involved in device evaluation. When you look at in-service use, Clinical engineers, that's what we do, day in, day out. We manage the in-service issues of device technology. So we're expert in that area. And the financial models, again, it's a thing that clinical engineers understand and are working with all the time. So clinical engineers are the very people who need to get involved in MedTech HTA. And until quite latterly, this has simply not been the case. So we need to get involved. We need to get involved for our own benefit. As a profession, we've been left behind. We haven't been involved in designing those tools that were designed in the big pharma field. So for our own sakes, we've got to get involved. We've got to get involved to help the HDA community. Brilliant as they are at health economics and human factors and data analysts, they don't understand the engineering aspects of technology, so we need to get in to support them. But perhaps more even than that, we need to get in, to get involved with uh, HGA. Clinical engineers need to be involved in HGA because the people ultimately we serve, our patients, won't benefit from the new technologies. And there are loads of new technologies on the horizon which could bring fantastic benefits. But if we clinical engineers don't get involved with supporting the HGA aspects of them, many of those new technologies won't get adopted. Over the past five years, I've done quite a lot of work um, with, with developing clinical engineering services and HGA. I'll spare you all the details, but we set up a service called CHEETAH. CHEETAH stands for the Center for Healthcare Equipment and Technology Adoption, and it's an HTA service run by clinical engineers. Now, we don't do it all on our own. We've got health economists, we've got human factors experts, we've got data analysts, we've got ethics managers. But we've developed a range of tools from an engineering perspective. We've worked uh, with NICE, uh, we've worked with about 50, 60 uh, medical device companies. We've run about 100 projects, uh, projects demonstrating that clinical engineers can have a very significant input into HTA. And I thought what I'd do is go back to the beginning of my talk, um, just as a rounding off point. I mentioned hyperspectral imaging, that first pictures of my hand there, trying to get the, uh, measure the oxygenation in my hand, and all the technical problems I had with that. Well, 30-something years later, you'll be pleased to hear, we've solved all those technical problems. And this is an image that we've taken recently. Left-hand uh, 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 image uh, is of a patient with diabetes, and it's a diabetic foot ulcer, and the right-hand one is an oxygenation map. Brilliant, fantastic, solved all those problems, can use it in a busy clinic now. And the question that I know you're dying to ask is, if we apply HJ technology, HJ method right now, is this going to be a device which can be adopted routinely into clinical service? I won't go through the tools that we use, but some of the tools that we've used over the past five years in terms of clinical, engi in, clinical engineering input to HTA, um, we've now applied them to this new hyperspectral imaging technique, and I'm less than delighted to tell you that when we do apply those techniques to it, the answer is that this hyperspectral imaging technology is not suitable for routine clinical application. The HTA does not support its adoption. The moral of which story is, it's very difficult to get new technology adopted into routine healthcare if you don't apply HDA, but the best HDA technology, uh, methodology in the world won't get your device adopted if your device shouldn't be adopted. Which actually is a good thing, because the NHS or other healthcare systems will be wasting money um, if it were to adopt this sort of technology. So I'll finish just to remind people that the main, my main message for you today um, is that we clinical engineers must get on board 
and are thankfully now getting on board with the HTA, uh, with the HTA environment. We've got to do it for our own sakes because it's a core part of new bringing new technology in. And if we're anything about, if we're about anything at all as engineers, we're about bringing in new technology, and HTA will allow us to do that. We've got to get involved to benefit the HTA community. Those health economists, those analysts, those human factors people need clinical engineers to help them do the HTA as med tech properly. But most important of all, we've got to do it for our patients. Good technology will not get adopted unless we can support the HTA of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.